Hey, y'all. You're listening to Diagnosing Sitcoms and Movies, the DSM podcast. We help make mental health more comfortable by using Black movies and shows we know and love and culture to remove stigma. So join our convo with your host, Courtney Copeland, licensed mental health counselor. And Dr. B, licensed professional counselor. What we finna do now is go back, way back. Back in back the time. In time. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I hear that, though, I, I gotta hear Black Street. <laughs> right. Oh, baby, no, baby, no, baby. <laughs> so, oh okay you're not done I'm sorry. Oh, I wasn't done because <laughs> you got it in my head you know I'd be ready to sing a tune mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that's perfect because today we are talking about the musical the 1954 classic Carmen Jones um it was adapted from an opera by this, um, it was really set in Spain and was all about some Spanish people. But then, you know, some people, Hammerstein and whatnot, they kind of took it over, revamped it and put an all black cast in it, which is kind of like, I want to say groundbreaking for it being the 50s. So I do I yes. definitely appreciate them having the, the, the chuspa to create <laughs> a film. <laughs> you heard it. It spit all on my mic. The chuspa. <laughs> I felt it. <laughs> to have an all black cast but not only am I excited to be talking about Carmen because girl you know I love a good musical mm-hmm. I'm excited because we have an awesome very intelligent just great energy all around knowing of things um and super involved uh Dr. Vanita Perkins hey Dr. Yeah. Vanita Yay. <laughs> so nice to be here today. I again, I appreciate you, Courtney, and and Dr. Rosie. This is awesome what you're doing here. So thank you for inviting me on. <laughs> no, thanks problem. for coming. Yes. So, Dr. Vanita, before we get started, can um you have a very interesting perspective and in your approach on how you uh, practice and use applied psychology? Can you tell everyone a little bit more about how you use psychology in your day to day work? Right. So, so um, my background is pretty varied. My work background, um, I have an IO psych a PhD and I look at leadership. So organizational leadership. And then my master's is also in organizational leadership and organizational management. So we primarily look at, look at workplaces and in workplaces, there's often this misunderstanding that you're just there to work labor and then go home. And we know that once you put two more, two or more humans in a room together, you have all this rich interaction. And then we layer it with how much the media, television and movies and, and music have impacted our lives. And we know that the stories that are told in art and in the media are also a reflection of us and we're a reflection on that. So we take a look at all of the parts and pieces of our civilization and see how it impacts us living these rich, full lives. And the goal is for everyone to be able to live a full life. So now we have to, with all of the harm that's been done in our society and the harm that's, you know, resurfacing, we want to look at how we can, you know, live better lives. And we also want to focus on mental health, right? Because there's so much um, stigma around it as as you both work so diligently to let, to advise people and educate people, but there's so much of a stigma around it that I think it's often easy sometimes to completely forget that we are co, you know, co-partners in our mental health and wellness. And the same effort we put into looking good and having, you know, bodies that are healthy, we need to put that maybe even more right into mental health. And now we we need to start (laughs) really embracing that and remove the stigma and, you know, all these health clubs, we need to have the same effort in, in clinical practice and then therapy, and we need to respect it and value it and really teach people how to be self-aware and how to understand who they are and to seek help when they need it. So that's a lot of what we're doing and bringing the psychology into it. And then we also want to have some fun. <laughs> yes. The fun no, is the most important fun. part. That's right. It's called that's what we do here at the DSM podcast. Is we have fun. <laughs> <laughs> and with that fun let that uh move us right into some of the quotes uh i just want to start off with when we- <laughs> carmen first walks into the door and the hating girls at the table say well get a load of this hip swinging floozy rolling around the working time for lunch 
<laughs> well, wait, why Carmen Turner look at her and say, Green Puss, you make sounds I don't like. <laughs> Just... <laughs> Hilarious I dynamic. That right? before. Prune puss. <laughs> no. And then, like, the visualization that came to mind, like, no. <laughs> my <laughs> eyes. <laughs> mm. Mm. Not even, I, I don't like what you said. I'm not trying to hear that. She said, You make sounds I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> She had clearly like taken the room, right? When she, she walked did. In. She mm-hmm. takes the room. And it's interesting the dynamic between all of them. Cause mm-hmm. it was so rich and vibrant that I had to remind myself, wait a minute, they're in a military plant. <laughs> and they're making parachutes. <laughs> right. Because everybody looked good. You know, they were dressed well. I was like, mm-hmm. I if I was in a factory, I don't know if I'd be looking like that when I went to right. work. Right. I was but, I was thinking that too. I was like, where's their uniform? <laughs> yeah, where's the letters? <laughs> and I love the dynamic between all of them because I was reminding myself they have worked together to, you know, they know each other. Mm-hmm. And they know each other's, you know, triggers and weak spots and yeah. Yeah. So much so they didn't see no problem with fighting on top of the sewing machine. None <laughs> Pulling each other's hair. Yes, um, they was getting it. She <laughs> mm, mm, mm. said I'm gonna scratch out that one good eyeball you got left. <laughs> right. <laughs> A good eye. <laughs> and you know, I uh, you wonder because the, the time frame of the original opera, all of these different time frames it's touching on and, and picking up little pieces, almost like, you know, when you pick up lint, it picks up all these little pieces and keeps moving it forward. And so you see a dynamic between these individuals and then it's, you know, adjusted for the 50s and then it's also adjusted for the original opera and then it's also um, bringing a modern light to how women interact with each other, right? And, and then what's okay and what's not okay. Right, like fighting on the table, like you said. <laughs> that fight scene was was hysterical because I was like, "Yeah, now they've been really fighting. Come on, oh, no, just pull the hair, pull the hair, pull the clothes. <laughs> yeah, it's moving around, just real fast. That's it. Just hugging each other. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and it was pretty raw. I think for 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 it to be so glamorous. <laughs> Yeah. Right, right. It was still the choreography, cute. right? She she even got one little hit on her, just with with just a little paw, little paw at her. <laughs> and you know, I wondered too. It almost seemed like it was a playful dance. That this is probably some of the yeah. stuff they do on a regular basis. Like you know, mm-hmm. when you get together with a person, maybe you lock horns with, and so there's a little head button going on. And I kind of sensed a little bit of that, like you know, little. Little gentle duking it out like they fighting like, again. again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's this Tuesday, is they fighting time. again. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna roll this thing out another time. <laughs> and I loved watching all the other all the other women around them how they were interacting and watching and engaging the scene. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's because they were you could see them like yeah go 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 you know <laughs> egging it on. <laughs> Beat her up, get her girl, get her. Yeah. And then, you know, I feel <laughs> definitely with Carmen and her and her personality, you could you can see why a lot of the women there were pretty much haters. If she had it going on, honey. Mm-hmm. It was so much hate. It was so much hate in this movie. Oh, Everybody, I diagnosed a couple of people with PhD <laughs> that we learned in belly. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, you know, you have to sometimes wonder. It was, it's the dynamic, right? I think we live now in a world where there's so many more intersections crashing together that the idea of that type of, you know, it's exhausting to be doing that every day. Like you come into work and it's just a tossle all day until you go home. <laughs> but but in a, in a world where there had been just coming out of World War II and so much violence, it makes sense that, and, and in the movie, it's set in actually in the middle of it, right? So mm-hmm. violence is just the name of the, the, the action of the day. So mm. it's so, and, and so many frustrations they must have had knowing that they're in the middle of this world war and that they might not be able to survive it. And so maybe more emotions rush to the surface in your interactions. And one thing with the frustrations too, I think 
I I kind of missed it watching it as a kid and then appreciated it too. Like imagine these characters like, yeah, they're in the middle of war, war, uh, world war, <laughs> but mm-hmm. they are still on a segregated base. It's an all black base because of segregation. Like that's a whole thing. But I'm not going to front. I enjoyed it being just black characters and black experiences and all the people in the background. Like when they when she walks into um the the bar and everyone's dancing and having a good time before they do the beat that rhythm off the drum. Like, I'm like, oh, look at all of this. Just joy and excitement. And I love watching Black people move and have a good time. And there was music playing. And that that brings me inner peace. But then I have to remember, oh, this is not just because this is a uh, a, a bar where people, Black people frequent. It's because there is segregation. They can't go other places. And this is the place that is there for them. Right. And it's also like, like you know, they speak of the juke joints, you know, you're... Mm-hmm grandparents or parent, well, probably grandparents or great grandparents. And those were the places where were that were safe for black people to let down their hair and really just express themselves. And 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 they often were set maybe, you know, as they say, off the beaten track. So then you don't have mm-hmm. to worry about interference from outsiders. So it was a chance to really just express. I just love the exuberance of the, all the characters too. Just the energy and excitement. And it it seemed you know, so many of the movies and, and even musicals during that time are so staged. And I felt like mm. we were seeing people who were actors and performers, but were expressing real lived experiences of people of color. Mm-hmm. And that was enjoyable too, to see that from a refreshing level. Cause you can see it in their eyes and the way that they interacted with each other, that it wasn't like a staged musical. It was a slice of, their version of what reality would be. And I think that's a testament to the awesomeness of the actors that they casted with there being Dorothy Dandridge, Harry Belafonte, per, uh, my grown man crush. I, ooh, I love me some Harry Belafonte. 80 year old Harry Belafonte can still get all my love. He's still fine. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> but, what? <laughs> I said it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, Pearl Bailey, the uh, young Diane Carroll. This was her first film. And just yes. having all of those heavy heater- hitters in this movie was just awesome. But I guess back yeah. to quotes. <laughs> because there were some funny ones. Uh, when <laughs> Carmen told them, excuse my dust, gentlemen. The air is getting mighty unconditioned brown here. <laughs> okay. Favorite. That I wrote that one down dust. too. <laughs> so much to unpack, right? So many levels. Like... She's like, um, I'm not here for it. Y'all are um, interrupting my airspace here. I'm out. Oh my and then god. When, um, she was like, when uh the dude, the boxer was trying to like get her attention and was like, Oh, maybe you didn't notice me outside. And <laughs> she was like, No, nah, you were so bashful. I didn't yeah. hardly even know you was there. <laughs> Well, and I like how she, she was so aware of her surroundings, right? Because the minute he rolled up, it was like she sensed it in the air and she parked herself on that balcony. Right. I'm not rushing out with with these other folk. Let me go (laughs) perch myself up here. Yeah. And and let him know who really is the center of the, of the room, right? Let him know really the center of attention. And and, and, and not, yeah. And not like, it wasn't like she forced it. It was like, she always knew where to be to position herself to be when when you're ready for the real thing you can come over here now uh-huh. look, look at the balcony look this way you can stand in your beautiful roadster car but it isn't you're not at my level mm, that's <laughs> it great okay so was it just me or rosie <laughs> especially did husky miller look like he could be bird in the midnight falcon's daddy <laughs> I was thinking it. I was like, where? I'm like, he looks like somebody. And I kept thinking, five heartbeats, five heartbeats. I was like, yes, that could be Bird. That was Bird. Oh, He looked like a butch. Husky Miller was a a strong butch Bird. (laughs) Basically, if if he didn't get it, that was his role. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Yes. So much richness. And then I was I was going to find, I think I had a, oh, one of my favorite quotes um, from Frankie. Love, nobody lives on that street forever. Oh. Mm. 
Mm. Love, nobody lives on that street forever. Mm-hmm. Who hurt you, Frankie? <laughs> yes. Frankie was out here trying to get these coins and use these men, okay? She's like, yeah. I'm not. Frankie she was a city girl. <laughs> she wasn't being shy about it. She was being At very all. out of it. I mean, this is like, th- this is how they want to play it. So this is how we're going to play it. And I think that for her to do that at that time, at that mm-hmm. day and age is like, it was very frowned upon because I mean, everybody, every woman, their goal was to be married more mm-hmm. specifically to a military man or a man who had a good job, right? A good paying mm-hmm. job, which made Joe so appealing to, to a lot of women, including Carmen. Yeah. Yes. Right. And like, I didn't diagnose Frankie or Mert because I really felt like I'm looking at the context of the time. These are young women. They're still young who have very limited options. And so one, Mm -hmm. yes, they're just trying to have fun. Like, yeah, girl, let's go to Chicago. They about to buy, you know, they doing all of this. But then also trying to, you know, find and carve out their space in life and what their life is going to look like and and trying to have some type of mobility there. And this is an opportunity and I'm going to take it. I'm young. I'm going to have fun. I'm not married yet. So I didn't see anything Thing, diagnosable at all about Frankie Emmer and I just love Pearl Bailey in this film like she was that, beat that rhythm out the drum um, child <laughs> yes well and it's interesting too about the two of them because like you said in that dynamic they seem to have figured out what Cindy Lou and Carmen didn't Ooh. They, they, right they seem to understand okay if these men are going to try to play us we're not going to go low and stoop to that level but we are going to meet them in a safe place where you know where where they can have our company and we can we can you know protect ourselves and honor ourselves and still we can all have a good time together Mm -hmm. and And, benefit right you don't see that dynamic with with cindy lou or with carmen the need for the need to you know you know understand your circumstances right Understand your circumstances. One of Clues bombs for that. Ooh. Mm. <laughs> because if you don't have options, and at that time there wasn't, you know, they couldn't go do an internet startup. So <laughs> you know, they had, you know, these limited options. Plus, I keep remembering that World War II people really, you know, World War One was scary. World War II was probably like, if this doesn't go well, we're all gone. Mm-hmm. So, you know, why am I going to throw away the life that I may not even get to have? Right. Going to Chicago. (laughs) Going to Chicago and I'm having a good time. (laughs) You girls got each other's back because that's another thing that we talk about, right? In Mm -hmm. these, in these, in this modern society that, you know, you don't leave your girlfriends behind. You don't let one go off by yourself. You have, Mm -hmm. you know, go in a group. Mm Mm-hmm. Watch each other's back. Facts. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. And so I guess my last quote is when... (laughs) When Carmen is fussing at um Joe, cause he's like, no, like I just got out of jail. Girls still trying to go to flight school. This didn't, this not stopping the plan. I'm still working the plan. And she's like, well, you look at them pit up girls and see what I get you, droopy drawers. <laughs> <laughs> she was so mad in that scene. <laughs> she's like, how dare you? And she every time have he dreams said and no, goals. <laughs> right? How dare you have dreams and goals? It's about me right now. And she's so used to men just throwing themselves at her. And Joe is like, no, but this came first. Like, I wanted this before you were you decided to come around. And she's like, um, no, get it together. Like, I'm first. I'm priority. I am the Carmen, you know, so, <laughs> the Carmen Jones. So and, act accordingly. <laughs> and, well, and, you know, I wondered, like, in a kind of creepy way, he was sort of slotting in the new girl, right? Like, Cindy Lou was on board with this. Why are you not? Exactly. It was like he has this plan, this life. Mm -hmm. And okay, now you're the woman of interest. So you're going to fit into my plan and what I have going. Look at the patriarchy at work. And he just whatever woman, it could be interchangeable. But this is what I'm doing. And so now I'm going to live the life that I planned, but I'm going to do it with you. Despite you telling me from the second I saw you exactly who you were. Exactly. Thank you. Exactly. Like. And she laid it out, not just in song and in hip. <laughs> she laid it out. She might have write, you know, it was like she wrote it down. I'm telling you, you know, you saw the me. The rest walk of the cafeteria. cafeteria knew it too. They sung her yeah, back you up. saw me walk this cafeteria. You saw me ting, ting, ting with each with each guy. You know who I am. You know you 
couldn't stop looking because they obviously had a history, right? So a little backstory in my head. I was like, he he's on the base. She's working there. They know each other. Mm-hmm. They are they have they know of each other, right? So mm-hmm. and he was trying to front while Cindy Lou was there to act like, yeah, I'm not paying her no mind. Mm-mm. No, I'm not looking at her. Because I wonder so, why why he was on her radar in the first place, right? Mm-hmm. But right? that's why I feel like she he was just turning her down at each turn. So in, in, in my mind, I'm like, he really was trying. Like, he was trying real hard. She probably, you know, flipped her hips a couple times. And he was <laughs> like, no, I got Cindy Lou with all that clavicle. Because she, she was serving up so much clavicle. And, <laughs> and I'm just focused. And he was like, nah, girl, go ahead. And like, he might have had to stiff arm her a time or two. And so when Sidney Lou was there, he was like, I'm not even going to look at her because I know she on that stuff. I'm not even going to look. But like, it was just so frustrating for me, the whole movie, because like she even sings like, boy, don't say I didn't tell you true. And then the rest of the audience, the, the cafeteria say she told you true. <laughs> I told right. you truly. If I love you, that's the end of you. Like if somebody is, this is, this is a life lesson. If somebody is telling you exactly who they are and what they are going to do to you. Believe if you it. don't listen, that's your fault. Mm-hmm. Word of the day. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just taking a pause to when people tell you, when they take the time to tell, and she didn't do it just once. She did it multiple times. Multiple. And what reminded him each time that he stepped out of line. Like, no, don't no man tell me where to go. I don't like being cooped up. No. <laughs> And she did it in pictures and song over and over again. <laughs> over and over again. I actually wrote that down as a quote. I don't account to no man. <laughs> and those and Joe says, you're accounted to me. I love you. And, and that give, given <laughs> some of the way they talked, it was like, <laughs> I can't keep up with this. They talk really <laughs> fast and very Southern. <laughs> mm-hmm. He's like, I love you. And that give me the right. And she said, that don't give you no right to own me. That's the only the only one that does, and that's me myself. Like she made it very clear in several different instances. I am my I'm my own woman. Ain't no man gonna tell me what to do. And, and I'm gonna was, ruin you if you right. <laughs> right. I'm gonna take you for all you have. I'm gonna run you dry. Okay. And then I'm gonna move on. Mm-hmm. That's what she said. The city girl. <laughs> Real ass bitch, give a fuck about a nigga. Mm-hmm. So put your armor on if you're going to step up in here. But then he, he, but I think he just had been Cindy Lou'd a little too much. <laughs> like he, he, you know, because he mm-hmm. definitely, I, Cindy Lou and her little suitcase everywhere she went. Everywhere she went. I'm looking because for Because she was chasing after this man. I felt so bad for Cindy Lou. And I feel like I, and I had to keep reminding myself, this is an all black cast. Mm-hmm. But this script is written by white people and mm-hmm. they are trying, they're positioning Joe for us to feel bad for Joe, but I don't feel bad for Joe. It was almost like they were trying to, to write a cautionary tale of being mm-hmm. like your own independent, uh, sexually liberated woman and doing things how you feel, see fit. Like it was like, they were trying to say, don't do that because you'll die at the end. And I was like, no, but I don't feel mm-hmm. bad for Joe. Like I, I, that's, mm-hmm. And like, even the way that that, like how Rosie was just saying, like the way that they spoke, it was real Southern. I was like, I feel like this was white people's best attempt at figuring out how black people talk. Yeah. Exactly. Interpreting their best attempt at interpreting their de- best attempt at even the, the you know, at, at the bar, their best attempt at interpreting what black people do inside a bar and mm-hmm. how we dance and all of that. And their best attempt at interpreting how black people should interact but what i still loved about the cast and especially knowing many of their careers because mm-hmm. many of them are gone now we we know diane carroll was not a pushover so mm-hmm. you, know, they, they, you they're like you can write the script and the music but i will still push my acting beyond that mm-hmm. right and i, I feel, feel like, like that's what the actors did like they are what elevated the movie to to what it was because i feel like the this like the writing and they, Pearl Bailey is the only person who really got to sing her own song. All of the other voices, Harry Belafonte and Dorothy Dandridge are, are lip syncing because they felt like their voices weren't strong enough for them to do the opera. So they had some white people come in and sing their parts. And if you mm-hmm. see, like, if when they when they speak regularly, like, yeah, there's a Southern draw. But when they, when the white people come in and sing, like, there's mm-hmm. a lot of that and theirs that are so hard yes. and over-enunciated yeah. that you're like, uh, okay. 
Yeah. Like, duh. <laughs> Every, <laughs> duh. They're singing duh. and they open, they open their mouths like um, Cindy Lou and and both Joe. We see all down their cavity, their teeth, all all in the back mm-hmm. of their throat. And I'm like, because yeah, like you're saying, if they were actually singing, allowed to sing it themselves, and I say aloud, mm-hmm. which is. Mm-hmm. Uh, they their mouths would have made a different shape because opera singers you know they don't always they don't necessarily need to extend their mouths that full right not at all times if you see if you see operas they Mm -hmm. they they have different ways of projecting so that's an interesting point i'm glad you brought that up because because it's just another subtle layer of how you know it was going to be a white representation so that the audiences would feel safe instead of allowing it to be a full representation of a lived experience of these characters. Boom. <laughs> My joke. Leading us in, I guess, into the diagnosis of Carmen, one thing that she said that stuck out to me was during her That's that's Love song. <laughs> that love. Not that's love. That love. That love. <laughs> Is... One man gives me a diamond stud and I won't give him a cigarette. Another man treats me like I'm mud. And that man (laughs) is all I got that man can get. Shorty said all I got that man can get. I don't know. I might have said all I got that man can get about Hillary Belafonte too. But Mm -hmm. uh, but she said like if you you could give me diamonds, bro, you can't get a cigarette from me. But you Mm -mm. treat me like mud. And all that I got, that man can get. All I got. It sounds mm-hmm. like Listen, some but you know, attachment issue. <laughs> attachment issues, but I feel like this is a real issue for many women yes. currently yes. in relationships. It's like this weird phenomenon where it's like the bad boy type mm-hmm. of complex where we want the man that clearly treats us like trash and then friend zone the guy who actually has some act right because and i've done it in previous situations now that i've grown up into the woman that i am (laughs) (laughs) i got some act right i learned (laughs) you know um but yeah i and i i felt that because it's like i've been there i've made those dumb decisions to let that man treat me like mud and still chase after him let him go all i got that man can get let him go. <laughs> Let him go, sis. <laughs> but her self-awareness to know that about herself, that's pretty mm. To know that and still do it. Right. Mm. That's to a know it of, and still do it. Repeatedly. Ah. Add that, repeatedly. Ooh. And and some of the, you know, grandma, <laughs> some of grandma's um, premonitions probably didn't mm-hmm. help, Right. Not at all. And, because you know, she, she held on to already. Yeah, she held on to that. And I wonder if holding on to those things is actually what caused her to speak her death into existence and even telling Joe, well, you're going to have to kill me then. I. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. And multiple times she was up in his face mm-hmm. ready to say, you you know, finish this. So that, yeah. that was, a, you know, path of destruction, like a. Death wish. Right. She almost gave him permission. Like, go ahead. Do what you got. I know it's coming. I'm going to go anyway, bro. Like, she she told him earlier, like, that's why she told him that she wasn't going to have a lot of kids because it wasn't in the cards for her. And Mm -hmm. she was like, she keeps telling him, like, the cards don't lie. And so she was like, I'm going to die anyway, bro. Like, Mm -hmm. what you, so what you going to do? You you going to let me go or not? <laughs> you're gonna be the one that that is the is my end, or is it gonna be somebody else? Because if they right. ain't, it'll be somebody else, right? Okay, she's like, I gotta go. But okay. to carry that with you, then to also want to be this emancipated woman, mm. everybody else's, you know, and even 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 in the cast, like everybody else in the in the factory was dressed in like blues and muted colors, and she was gonna pop everywhere she went. Yeah. Right? Always gonna. So, but to carry all those different layers. And then to try, because I was wondering, do, do we think she really wanted love? I think she wanted it, but didn't know what it, she couldn't accept it. And couldn't figure out what she, it really was, right? Right. I don't yeah. think she experienced love. Right. To know what it really was. And so that is why she felt that if she was treated like mud, then perhaps that's the type of love that she 
mm-hmm. is deserving of or knows because it's more familiar. You treat me kindly. I'm not familiar with that type of act of kindness and love. So no, I'm not going to pay you that much attention. But if you treat me like I've always been treated, then that's right. But we don't realize that how we've always been treated isn't always the best way for us. No. And and what and, and then, of course, she had a whole, you know, suitcase full of goodies to deal with somebody who treated her like garbage. Mm-hmm. What, she what, knew what to do with that. Yeah, well, she knew what to do with that in every which way. Right. But how about something else? And maybe there's a little bit of her connection with Cindy Lou there of not never being able to probably let her guard down or trust enough to have that kind of, you know, to even move in the direction of Cindy Lou. Mm-hmm. And I'm assuming that there is, because I always make up, you know, fill in the blanks in my mind of what happened. <laughs> so in my mind, uh, that's why Carmen was with her grandmother. Like when she go home, she sees her grandma, like in granted, mm-hmm. even, you know, usually grandma's is, hey, baby, nice to see. You. She's like, no, nope, trouble coming your way. It was a buzzard, a feather on the door. I'm getting this water, move girl. And I yeah. think that in, but with that too, she might have gotten that same type of, or I'm thinking even more so neglect um in her childhood because Mm. criticism or neglect in childhood can lead to feelings of vulnerability and an inability to trust or depend on other people and to Mm -hmm. compensate for those type of feelings people can develop a mask of superiority and self-sufficiency that separates them from other people to reduce their uh that ability to connect and um be on an intimate level with other people Mm -hmm. and then there's always that that those around that then overvalue that child and instill that inflated self sense of self-worth which is kind of what we see that the community community she's going and she's getting whole free chickens and (laughs) whole free chicken (laughs) and then she tossed him at the end that man a few coins it looked like and it was like they were like got you you, got you you know build up her bag but then like uh it, when that happens those children um often internalize that those messages that they're special and deserve that superior treatment and then learn to, they rarely learn um responsibility or accountability for their mm. actions and mm. so that can lead to the, uh having a shallow capacity for intimacy lacking empathy and trying to seek control and manipulate others which we definitely mm-hmm. see carbon doing <laughs> absolutely so given that that information what did you diagnose Carmen with oh I feel like I don't know if we're going to say what okay so I diagnosed Carmen with narcissistic personality disorder okay okay all right Uh-oh. let me hear it. I'm, I'm in the personality realm I didn't go okay. into the cluster I didn't okay. go into the cluster so tell me what you're thinking All right. So for the criteria that I felt that she fit was um, having the grandiose sense of self-importance where uh, you expect others to recognize you as superior without commensurate achievements. She did nothing to earn this feeling. And she just went and gave that man her uh, her lunch bill and said, go ahead and pay it. Even if no, I just told you I'm not going to to the club with you tonight. (laughs) But it was almost like she he knew she he knew he was like, give me the bill, I know. Right. He was so excited. He was so to proud pay it. to pay it. Yes. At first I thought it was her digits. I was like, oh, okay. It was, no, it was it's, her it's her bill. <laughs> okay. Is uh is preoccupied with fantasies of unlimited. And for her, I picked ideal love. Like she really was going mm. to pastors every night waiting for him for Joe to come because she was preoccupied with that ideal love, has a sense of entitlement, um, unreasonable expectations, especially favorable treatment or automatic compliance with his or her expectations. She really thought that man was not going to go. He was just going to give up on all his dreams right? (laughs) and do what she said. Requires excessive admiration and as well as is impersonally, interpersonally exploitive, taking advantage of others to achieve his or her own ends, lacks empathy, is unwilling to recognize or identify with the feelings or, and needs of others, and shows arrogant, haughty behaviors or attitudes. I mean, definitely describes her. <laughs> <laughs> For me, I went with a general personality disorder. Okay. And so it's some of the same things as far as, you know, the cognition, the ways of perceiving themselves and interpreting themselves and others and events. So, again, having that that inflated self-esteem, you know, feeling like I'm going to take up this space in this room because it's all about me. 
Um, and then affectivity. So the appropriateness of her emotional response, especially when Joe was telling her, like, listen, I got to go back. I, I got to go back to, to boot camp. That was a really extreme, you know, back and mm -hmm. forth. And I feel like some of it was really just trying to convince him, like, if you don't stay with me, then you're losing everything, you know? And so I'm the most important thing here. Make the right decision. To the um, point where she was really about to go with the, the sergeant. Like, yeah. that's how they ended up fighting. Like, exactly. Exactly. You could even see a, a smirk on her face as she's like, mm -hmm. you know, attempting to leave with him. It's like, what are you going to do? Are you going to fight mm -hmm. him? Mm -hmm. you gonna do? You gonna fight your superior? Yeah. Um, so she pushes him to that point. And then as far as like impulse control, you know, um, I think about just the, the scene of them actually go on their way to go to, I guess, the jail. I forget the, the name of the community. What was the name of the community? Was it Masonville? Masonville. Something like that. Yeah, Masonville. On their way to Masonville. And she was acting a fool. She just could <laughs> not control herself. <laughs> Like all the way in the back of the car, in the front of the car, and then put on that train with her heels on. Child, she was like, out with. She was running on that train her. in them heels. <laughs> heels in a fitted skirt, jumping in on a that fitted train. Skirt. Not to mention the train, but also after jumping off the train onto some rubble down the <laughs> down and the hill, down, down the rocky hill, <laughs> all in the weeds and the dirt and the sand. <laughs> I was just like, and then still had on the same crisp, clean outfit. See, now that to me is is a problem. Like, how are you not dusty looking? 50s Hollywood. Hollywood. That's it. 50s yeah. Hollywood. Where they you know what? But, I but, would you know, like to did... highlight, though, that they did their own stunts. Kudos to them. Hey. <laughs> yeah. And, I mean. And if it, well, they probably, because the producer probably wouldn't pay for it. Uh, right. Exactly. This film only cost $800,000 to make. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So it's like. If y'all want, if y'all want to get that lunch tomorrow, then on the set, <laughs> don't want this hill. <laughs> but but it was jump on this train. How how you know she got all in the sand and stuff, and this was yeah. going, you know, and it was to me, it was a metaphor for she was going to drag him down in it. Yes, Ooh, foreshadowing. Mm -hmm. I like it. Yeah, it. getting all it, it, and 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 I I saw her saying this ain't going to be easy. I told you it's not going to be easy. Right. He's right. trying to tie her up with anything just to get her under control again a metaphor for me again of trying to like he's trying to harness this person it's like do you see yeah. that she is running from you she is coming to you when you want to pull away and running when you want her you know what i mean it's like mm, what man. more do you need to see and then she, didn't even tell her about the bridge that was going to break knew that she yeah. said uh, you gonna see it she, she like hey, she I, hey ain't no way to get there he was like ain't nothing i'd like to see the road that can stop this baby she said oh you gonna see oh, it sugar. okay yeah. and <laughs> i'd like to see the, i'd like to see the girl who can stop this man mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you gonna see it sugar <laughs> right listen and then how just even how she she he, he she convinces him to take off the the restraints and then how she runs up the vehicle you know, and then he goes to the side. <laughs> she runs up in, the, in her heels. And I'm just like, yeah. wow. She's, she's a runner. She's, she's a, a track, track star. star. She gonna run away when it gets hard. She <laughs> get she all get pathways hard. again, like going on the balcony. If everybody's going left, she's gonna go right. Yes. If everybody walks around the Jeep, hello, safest way to go. She's gonna go right into danger, right, right. up right up the front right. of in the heels, in her little skirt, all that. Mm -hmm. And then just defy the just defy it constantly, mm -hmm. right? But as I always say, she stood up in her wholeness. She said, "This is who I am. This mm -hmm. is who. This is how it is. I'm gonna remind Show you me. if you forget. Ain't no one man cooping me up. I was not mad when she got with Husky Miller. Yeah. I said, "Hey, no. what? and uh, Joe, we going we, so everybody gonna try to act like Joe didn't try to like." grab her up and like get off <laughs> he like, did in, in the hotel room like hey bruh, th there's my boundary <laughs> right <laughs> put your okay. hands on me I, mm -hmm. yeah. so I wasn't mad that she got with Husky Miller Husky no Miller. I wasn't I wasn't but then even with Joe I was like okay now Joe is starting to become irritable so then that's for me that's when I'm like okay I feel like he's going through something now too having realized that I've I've allowed this woman to derail me He's frustrated. He's angry with her. And I don't think it's more that he just was so in love with her. I think he was really mad at the fact that I punched my my superior 
Now I have MPs after me. I'm mm -hmm. not going to get the rank and the position that I've been working my ass off this whole time because mm -hmm. I decided to run off with you. I allowed you to convince me to put his body in the bushes <laughs> and to come to Chicago. And you have the audacity to leave me in this room. What did you own me? You? <laughs> mm -hmm. But and at the same, but at the same time, he saw himself doing it. So no, it's like nobody doing put it. A gun to his and then head. like nobody put your fist on that man's face. No, no mm -hmm. you know what I mean. Nobody, no. you know, forced you a gunpoint onto that train. So mm -hmm. you know, so you want to come along for the ride? And I've already told you, you're caging a tiger. I already yeah. told you. That. So, and I, and I keep telling you every step of the way, not just like I told you in the beginning, I'm telling you. <laughs> and then when it happens, I tell you, see, that I told you this was going to happen. And still, and still, she said, you cannot cage me. And that rat-a-tattle hotel room. <laughs> yeah, that would have gave me a little anxiety too. I've been like, what the hell? It was driving. Are you saying he's, that train is enough to crazy. drive you crazy? <laughs> yeah, he couldn't even pour his coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, I wanted to pop back just for a second to when she's at, at her grandmother's house, mm -hmm. how she's like cleaning his clothes up. Now, mind you, the one who got him messed up in the first place with all her crazy activity. Right. And then she's in such, she puts herself deliberately into such a subservient position. In between his legs. Let me sit yeah. on the floor in between your legs and scrub your boots, baby. And, and scrub and clean and mm -hmm. I'll polish your thing. And I saw a glimpse in the moment, in that moment of, Maybe what we were saying earlier, maybe she was trying to 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 just test out, you know, subservient wifiness and going, yeah. Mm. <laughs> no, because she only polished one shoe, actually. Oh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's really I think well. she wanted both. I think when I'm here, I'm going to be in this role while I'm here. But like, right. I'm not staying here. Not like, staying. so we'll do it up and we'll do, you know, what we do while we're here. But then when I go and I do this, then I'm going to be fully in that role doing that. And like, no, don't, you don't get no to questions. pick. And yeah. And you don't get to pick when I move from one to the other. I am the person that gets to pick that. And to me, that was the highlight of the narcissism for me, because like she was bringing him in and wooing him with all of this stuff. But at the same time, like, hey, look, I warned you. Like I don't told mm -hmm. you not. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it was a lot of gaslighting going on and making him feel like he was crazy for all the stuff that was going on. But at the same time, Joe, mm -hmm. this is your fault, bro. Had you just minded your business and stay with Cindy Lou, why you let that woman change your belt? Why you let that woman touch your belt? Like, mm. I know, but think about it. Mm -hmm. Why do guys let women do that? They know they're being seduced. They know the dance and they're playing along so they can later say, she took it off me. I did not do that. She took it off me. Right. So, right? Hey, look, if somebody oh, tried to touch my dude belt, bro, you better punch her in the mouth. Don't you okay. let no woman touch your belt? <laughs> like, just yourself. Well, um, first of all, go to her town, walk to her town, and then go all inside her house. If you really are going to stand up and not, and not engage, if you're mm -hmm. really not going to be that type of male, then you you stand stand true to what you know and don't 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 bend or budge on it, right? Mm -hmm. so he put, he walked himself in all the situations where he left himself sort of you know no options, but he certainly had a good time while he was going in there. So I'm not right. even and he, and she said all along, I'm not trying to have money. I'm not trying to get that. I'm more about something deeper, right? You know something more intense. I'm not about trying to hook up with some guy so you can be a pilot and I can be your wife. And the same mm -hmm. thing with Husky Miller. I'll put on a dress and everything because everybody else is doing it. But she also pointed out that she wasn't trying to get his money. She wasn't. She that wasn't. No. Right? And I mean, you she, can't... she could have asked him directly, but she asked Frankie instead. You know, right. like, let me let me get a couple dollars off you. And Frankie's mm -hmm. like, listen, I got my jewels and everything, but that's about it. <laughs> Girl, they no paying us in diamonds. I ain't got no dollars. <laughs> <laughs> So, and look, look, all we're getting out of this is dresses and some jewelry, honey. Like, right. he's like he's not selling in some cash, but it's interesting. It's You're right. Pay a she, went, move. <laughs> she, went to, she went to Frankie, maybe because she didn't want to open that door too, right? Because right. that's a different kind of door. Her mm -hmm. interaction with men wasn't about like a sugar daddy kind of like play. No. Her interaction was 
like I'm saying, on that more visceral level, right? And mm-hmm. during that time, she still was like, nah, Joe's my main thing. Like, I'm not, I don't, I don't she think was. that she ever really like was just like, I'm just using up Joe. Like she was like, no, I got, I'm waiting on, I was waiting on him. I got him. Like, I'm about to go pawn my jewelry possibly to take care of us. Like mm-hmm. she was still on that with Joe. But then Joe started doing that, that toxic masculinity i mm. own you you're my possession this yes. is how cindy lou works and so i'm gonna confront you with that and she's like whoa 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 bro i told you who i was you was acting like you was cool with it now you're trying to flip the script like that's not the relationship that here. i want so yep. matter of fact i'm out i might wow. come back i might not i'll see you when i see you right mm-hmm. and every single situation notice they were again in a contained space right so now he's trying yeah. to take the jail mm-hmm. in the beginning then He's then he's trying to, you know, he's having her wait at the bar and there's that whole dynamic while he's while he's actually jailed. Right. And Mm -hmm. then they get to hotel room. He's again in these confined spaces. And she keeps saying, I don't do confinement. Mm -mm. (laughs) If you put me in a a, a confined space, I'm going to go. I'm at my grandmother's house. We stayed the night, but I got to go. Right. Every single time. Saying like her parents locked her in a closet or something. Something terrible happened. Something. (laughs) If you box me in, I I have to go. And then also too, like you said, uh, Courtney, I think society, you know, all the time up into that, you know, when that script was written, mm-hmm. women were always boxed in. Didn't mm-hmm. have, you know, if you had money, you possibly were in um, a lifestyle that you could make some decisions for yourself, but it just wasn't an option, you know. And it's I always not like only where you women. boxed in, but you're supposed to be, you're expected to be happy with that. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. You're mm-hmm. supposed to enjoy this confinement. Mm-hmm. And right. so that's why with Cindy Lou and I think Joe had this weird, oh, I hated the, the the song that I hated the most was the song that him and Cindy Lou sung to each other. Where oh, he was God. like, you look just like my ma. Like you walk, you walk like just she. like. I was what? like, ew, that's disgusting, sir. Okay. <laughs> I was like, uh, yeah, ugh. But it, was also, it was also a, a generational message of like so. our grandparents did it, our parents did it, we're gonna mm-hmm. do it. And it's like and guys, that's, that sounds where's disgusting. The love? Where's, where's the love? The love? No. You're just gonna do what the people before you did. You yeah. don't even know what their circumstances were, but no. you're gonna just play the game, play the you know, play the roles. But that goes to the point of like even understanding marriage within itself. Marriage yeah. was never about love, especially back then. Marriage was always about, you know, okay, let let your family has this wealth or we have this type of property or cattle, whatever it is. Let me let me trade you my daughter for, you know, some of some of your land or for a little bit of my cattle. And so it was never really about love. And it wasn't until like maybe I don't know, maybe around this time where, you know, they really started to kind of want to build on just more so commercializing marriage and and diamonds and you know making love so wonderful but really i don't even think people now to this day understand what love oh, really yeah. is no and i and i and you know we're looking at it in the lab too we're looking at what what love really is and of course the people who are happy in it often don't talk about it so they don't add to the lived experiences of defining it mm. but you're right you're right so so knowing that that the goal of it was to pass wealth, to maintain and pass family wealth or property or things like that, and to make children. And that's That's it. That's a pretty toxic, (laughs) toxic, um, you know, uh, restrictions or rules or guidelines for it, but not to allow people to really fully express themselves in a relationship with another, or if people are into multiple, you know, whatever their choices, not being able to fully express yourself and understand that you, you, inherently connect with this person it's just you know you find somebody the closest person so i saw that in the mom and pop comments yes. that you know my my mom you know we lived in the same because remember he said we're neighbors like you know we're like right down the street so it's like mm-hmm. we're right down the street we're roughly around the same age we're we're childbearing you know ready so let's let's do it, it. And, then, yeah. and then oh yeah and then and then we and we'll go through the actions of being in love and hope that our hearts catch up with us. Basically, yeah. But Cindy Lou's heart was there. She mm-hmm. loved that fool, but she mm-hmm. was the only one in love. 
And mm-hmm. I don't know if it's because like that it was what her definition of love went. And so she just devoted herself completely because that was the expectation and she didn't want anything outside of that. But all of that being said, I diagnosed her with adjustment disorder unspecified because she her whole <laughs> world was turned upside down. Like you, we have this whole life plan. We just we planned out mm-hmm. everything that we're going to do. And then it's all completely different but i tell you what them mps might couldn't have found uh <laughs> joe but cindy lou was like hey look uh carmen i'm here this magazine you. i need to find him <laughs> this newspaper i know says, you won <laughs> and, he, and, and i'm not looking for him i'm looking for the people he run with you know yeah where, where she's a little detective <laughs> she's a little detective i still i still keep asking myself what was with the suitcase though she's a little detective knew where he was but mm-hmm. walked ten thousand miles to get to him and brought her bags with her Listen, so was like, ready to go up on a face. No ID. She was about to get shot. Okay. You're talking about, I'm here to see Joe. So, whoa, 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 where are you going? <laughs> Where's but your ID? Damn, this is a military base. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm bringing my stuff with me. I'm bringing everything. I, a suitcase for me was a metaphor of I've got every, all of my stuff. Everything I own is in this thing and I am going to bring it to this. I'm going to bring right. whatever I got. And he's and like, I can pick up my whole life and bring it to Joe because this is all that I have and this is mm. all that I need. And only thing that completes that is Joe. Ooh. I, I really feel her- like Joe, if Joe goes sprints the rest of if they don't kill Joe because you know it's the 50 so they might you know kill him right. but if Joe spends the le- rest of his life in prison Cindy Lou's going back they're getting married and she's having a jailhouse husband yeah because she <sighs> said they said you know he's been a, you know the, all his life is a mess and she's like mm, I don't care I don't care what he did you see my suitcase I brought my suitcase oh, I'm in I'm here I don't care I'm what moving. he's done I'm moving to this town now okay <laughs> I'm here I live here now <laughs> I live here <laughs> <laughs> Joe, you want me to sit right here and wait for you to come back? Okay, I'll sit right here and wait the for you to come back. The funniest thing, though, she probably sat in that cafeteria till like midnight. Like, where's Joe? Ma'am, ma'am, the cafeteria is now closed. <laughs> you gotta go. <laughs> okay, let me go find Joe. <laughs> okay, I'll find Joe. <laughs> I wonder, it would have been great to see footage of like, or if they would have shot scenes when he was, you know, when he was in prison, like her, mm. like immediately visiting and, and and parking her little self outside with a little tent. Her little or suitcase, sit, sitting on her suitcase. <laughs> what? Oh, poor Cindy Lou. Cindy Lou, um, you know, um, from The Grinch, Cindy Lou. Cindy yes. Lou. <laughs> Cindy Lou. Who? And the same little hair, the same little pigtails in the original Cindy Lou. I said, Ooh. little button nose. And that was from the 70s, I think. So this movie is 1954. So I said, I wonder if that was a play on a commentary on the innocence of Cindy Lou that they put in The Grinch. Because people might have seen Carmen in the 70s. People, you know, 1970, where people probably, I mean, it was a popular film. So I was like, mm. I wonder if the, because the innocence, the pureness, the naiveness, right? Yeah. The, yeah. the Cindy Lou and the Who, she's just like, yes, we can, we can bring Christmas back. So right. I, and you blink, blink, blink with the Yes, Joe, eye. you'll get out of prison and we'll get back together. Yes. <laughs> oh my yeah. gosh. I, I, I couldn't diagnose her for Cindy Lou. <laughs> yeah, I could. I couldn't diagnose her. I felt I kind of feel a little bad for her. I'm not gonna lie. She's <laughs> the only person in the movie that I feel bad for. Period. She's the only one only who has person. my sympathy. Like, oh, Cindy, <laughs> oh, Cindy Lou. Lou. Oh, Cindy Lou. Bless her heart. Um. So I put I put relationship distress with spouse or mm. intimate partner. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And now I and, feel like and, both. Those two, both. Both, the adjustment right? Adjustment and the V-code. <laughs> yeah, there we go. So we we tag team that one. And then <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to, I'm definitely going to give you narcissistic personality disorder for Carmen, okay. for sure. I went general because I didn't know, yeah, there were some things in there. I, I was debating between histrionic and then uh, mm. uh, nar- narcissistic. And then I was like, maybe just general. So I, I can definitely see that. Now, Joe, on the other hand, oh, no, <clears throat> Jesus, girl, I struggled. <laughs> I str- I had to dig deep mm. layers. So at first I was like, oh, yeah, he's going to be like, um, you know, like, what was it that I gave him? I gave him a delusional disorder and a jealous type, but that didn't fit because he wasn't he wasn't having like delusions. 
<laughs> she she was out here with Husky. Like, this. <laughs> right. it wasn't delusional. She left. <laughs> right. <laughs> There's nothing delusional about this. So I said brief uh, psychotic disorder. And one, and it says pres, uh, presence of one or more of the following symptoms. And the, the last symptom is grossly di- uh, disorganized uh, and catatonic, cat- catatonic behavior. Um, and so I feel like his behaviors once he got to Chicago is what I think he had a brief psychotic disorder when he came to Chicago. I think everything just hit him at once. And that's when you saw him get really more aggressive with her and shaking her. And then I would say it's with Mark stressors. So um, basically, you know, have, having the event with his his sergeant and, you know, realizing like, oh, when, once I get captured or once this comes and hits the fan, I'm I'm about to be out, out on, on my ass, basically. Um, and I think that caused him to lose his shit for a minute. So I'm going to go brief psychotic disorder with mark, market stress. And then a Z code of personal history of military deployment and mm-hmm. um, another Z code of problem related to current military deployment status. Okay, so I will give you the the, the psychotic nature. However, okay. I went a different route with it. Mm-hmm. I gave him, diagnosed him with major depressive d- disorder with atypical features and mood congruent psychotic features. And so for the actual uh, depression, I felt that he had um, the and so this is the depression started with him going to jail when he was just holding on to that flower and looking all good and singing with a shirt off to that flower, all sweaty, looking like a glazed donut with that terrible (laughs) hairline. Oh, I just love him. Okay, not a glazed donut. Love you, Arabelle Fonte. Okay. Anyway, uh, depressed mood most of the day, <laughs> nearly every day. Uh, markedly dim- diminished interest or pleasure in um, almost all activities, where to the point where car- being around Carmen was the only thing that had brought him pleasure after a while. Um, psychomotor ag- agitation or retard- retardation nearly every day with him pacing around that little tiny raggedy apartment that they was in. Feelings of worthlessness or excessive inappropriate guilt nearly every day. Diminished ability to think or concentrate nearly every day with him being frustrated, like even when he was trying to pour that coffee and talk about the train and how it was impacting his ability to focus. Um, Recurrent thoughts of death. Now, this one I wasn't exactly sure about because it does go recurrent suicidal ideation. He did have thoughts of death, but his thoughts was about killing Carmen. So he had (laughs) recurrent thoughts of death, but it was towards someone else. And so then with the atypical features, uh, wait, I gave specifically that one. Now, there is a little bit more that I would have to assess for just because I'm not exactly sure that we saw all of the criteria there being met. But what stood out for me most was the mood reactivity. And so mood brightens in response to actual or po- potential positive events. And so when Carmen would come back around, his mood would brighten right up. But then he also had the um, interpersonal rejection sensitivity that results in significant social or occupational Im- impairment, which he had not had. Well, he had not ever really received rejection. He had the woman that he wanted and they was together the whole time. He had the career that he wanted. He got picked out of everybody on base to go to flight school. So he had never really dealt with rejection. But every time that we he, we see him face it in the movie, he has very big sensitivity to it and very big responses to it. And so that is why I gave the atypical features. And then the mood congruent psychotic features as well, where the content of the delusions and hallucinations are consistent with the typical depressive themes of personal inadequacy, guilt, disease, death. And so observed punishment, so on and so forth, where he felt like, I love Carmen so much, but they, she's not choosing to be with me. So she has to die. Like, and then I hope, because even in, after he chokes her to death, he sings a, t- a terrible song. He says something like ring me up high on a tree. And like, so he was saying so that I could be with my darling, be with my baby, be with my Carmen. So he was doing that so that they could be together in the afterlife. And so that is why I felt like he was delusional because he was saying like, if I can't love you in this life, I'm going to, I'm going to kill you and let them kill me so that we could be together in the afterlife. All of which would just, was just terrible and and you know the Poor death Joe. of you said about the death. I do think he was. It was the death of the life he knew. Mm. So, so he wasn't of himself dying, 
mm -hmm. every time he had an interaction with her, more of the things that he planned for his life were dying off. Mm -hmm. White school was Facts. dying. His, now he doesn't have the relationship with Cindy Lou. So that's where I saw the death, death, you know, him ideating. I mean, I'm, I'm not, you know, the clinical words that are the clinical terms that are appropriate, but that's what I saw mm -hmm. with that. It was, like, you know, a little piece of him was dying every time. And I wrote down yeah. a note that he was just digging a bigger and bigger hole every time. <laughs> Oh, child, time. it's getting worse and worse. And then that's why I also gave him the V code because if, you know, the military jail does see fit to just keep him incarcerated, that would be the only time that I would see him as a client. And so then possibly I would also gave the V code for a counter for mental health services for mm -hmm. a perpetrator of spouse or partner violence physical. Mm -hmm. And so I I don't, uh, he wants to die at this point so that he could, so I would be, I would be concerned about his safety going forward if he was to just be incarcerated and not be sentenced to a death penalty and I would have him on suicidal suicide watch like I would there would it would have to be so intensive at first he would have to be on a mood stabilizer just to get him to a place where he can regulate regularly oh, oh. and the tree, the tree line <laughs> that, that was... hanging to the tree I was like that was so especially with what we know about lynching and the horror and he's singing of it. it in the 50s uh, yeah, huh. and more of it. it and, uh, yeah, <laughs> it was. In, 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 but I do think it was a subtle messaging about, mm -hmm. you know, the hopelessness of situations and knowing that, you know, the things that he now had been engaged in, especially like you said, with the military meant that that his future was now gone. Right. Mm -hmm. Dang. So what are your prognosis for <laughs> for Cindy Lou and Joe? I mean, well, we if, about it, but. if, yeah, if he stays in prison, if they don't, okay, so first of all, I think they're going to kill him. Like, at, if they mm -hmm. don't kill him, I be, would be concerned about him killing himself inside for that, you know, for that first couple months. So if he lives, I feel like if we could get him stabilized, Cindy Lou going to come. She going to find him. They going to get back together and they going to get married okay. on the inside. <laughs> Maybe if he get 25 to life and he get out in 25, then then they'll just, you know, resume their life together or whatever. And oh, oh Lord Jesus. And have conjugal visits in between. So she probably oh, done still birthed him a couple children, even though he said mm. that he didn't want no kids until they could take care of him. But the life that you planned has long gone. Um, like Dr. Vernita just said. So mm. that's a wrap. But I really don't feel like there's a prognosis. There's no prognosis for Carmen because she did. I feel like uh, <laughs> Joe gonna die too. So he, he gonna be dead. It's just Cindy Lou recover from all of this and finding her own identity and what life will look like for her moving forward as her own individual person. And I'm sure it's just going to be her anxiously attaching herself to another man. Yeah, I was gonna say, cause, mm. cause she, uh, but at this point now she's even damaged, right? Because her yeah. interaction with Carmen and Joe and the whole the entire setting has has definitely marred her. So how would she move forward? Because if she was clingy in that way, I, I don't know if, if if she could do it without like disrupting the essence of who she is, right? I think the problem with Cindy Lou is almost similar to what we talked about with Carmen and saying being treated like mud. I think that Cindy Lou realized that she she did have a good man in Joe. And she cl she was clinging on to the version of him that that she originally fell in love with. And even that song that she sang outside of, you know, the, the weight, the dressing room was basically saying, I don't know why I keep holding on to this man, but I, I just can't get him off my mind. I can't let him go. And so I think Ooh. that she just the same way Joe had that infinity for Carmen. She had that infinity for him. And it really was like a terrible love triangle, mm -hmm. if you will, that kind of turned into a square when you add uh, <laughs> Husky, what's his name? <laughs> Husky Miller. Bird Husky in the Midnight Falcon. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I mean, he wasn't even really a love interest. Which is yeah, because I was saying he was, pass he was just passing through. So right. he, was, he was like, because he they said, uh, yeah, when he gets to the next town or the next boxing match, there's going to be another new, a bunch right. of new so don't, right. don't I don't know though, because he really had a thing for Heat Wave and uh what you call he it? Wave. Joe came at him with a whole knife. That man just said, Okay, let me get this towel. Come on, yeah, this, what you want to do? I, and knock Joe out. <laughs> <laughs> do you think that like I felt like Carmen was, you know, like she put herself on that pedestal. And mm -hmm. I think that other women around him were just, you know, uh, trying to cling, trying to ride his yeah. coattails, whatever. Yeah. 
And then he sees this person who doesn't want his money and doesn't mm -hmm. care. And it's mm -hmm. not, you know how you see those scenarios usually in the woman's playing hard to get just, you know, and the, and the guy, she was like, I'm not trying to play hard to get. I'm, I'm not playing. Play. <laughs> <laughs> I know, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and he's like, I'm a boxer. I'm famous. I got money. And she's like, yeah, I, I'm more famous. Bye. <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, until, well, <laughs> until she had her cards bred and then she was, you know, singing about death. And then all of a sudden it's just like, I'm just going to live my life. Come here. And yeah, yes. but I think that intrigued him. I think that yeah. sparked like he that that's that wildfire passion that he liked mm -hmm. about her. That's why he caught her heat wave. She had that heat. She had that passion and she yeah. was living life in a way that he wanted to also live high on the hog and enjoy every moment. And mm -hmm. yeah, I got this money. Like, let's have fun. Like I wor I'm working hard so that we can do this. And, he and she was willing to do it. And he couldn't remember because he said the trainer has him, you know, and the manager yeah. said you have to Ooh, sleep they had a tight rip the on, rip on you them. had to eat nutrition. So his whole life mm -hmm. was written and structured. And here she was going, that's on you, baby. I don't mm -hmm. live like that. You got choices. I, and I think they both wanted that, just that, that perception of freedom in a relationship. And so I think if they had that, that time to grow with each other, if, you know, Joe had to kill her in the broom closet, that they yeah. would have... <laughs> <laughs> possibly had a successful future with each other because mm -hmm. she was like, this is like, she was sitting watching the fight and was like, this is just the beginning. I think like that really mm -hmm. shifted something yeah. for her and why she was so adamant with Joe in that closet. Like this, I don't want you. This is over. This is done. Like mm -hmm. you, you look at what, look at what you're doing right now. This is the opposite of what I want. You are not presenting yourself in the way that I want. You know what I want. You know what I'm about. And you're doing the opposite of that. Here, take your little tin ring. Those black circles around your eyes. Yeah, but now let me let me say this about Husky though. If he was all into her that much, why was he celebrating and walking off and not having his people at least keep an eye on her and you know support mm. her? Right? I mean, he so in his defense, he was trying to grip hands with her. Like if you look like they have him raised in the air, he's really reaching for her and he's trying to grab her and they are like pulling him along. And so I guess he's just thinking she's a part of that celebration. But yes, if he I think had that relationship grown a little bit more, it would have gotten to the point where it was hey, watch my girl, make sure she's good. Yeah, well, he, he should have been walking beside him, not in the beat behind him where he could where he could. You know what I mean? Like if, mm -hmm. if he. If he wanted her to be a partner, then so the fact that he's able to because I was watching to go, OK, well, how's he going to get her <laughs> off to the side? And he just pulled her into the room. I mean, I'm like, that's a girl. That's not going to happen. So so there's a little bit of a like, I feel like it's a buddy relationship. They're working on it. They would have okay, gotten okay, but then We'll also, let him have that. We'll let us. And then also <laughs> the the perpetrator in, in this instance is Joe. She mm -hmm. she knew him, which is why she was yeah. willing to go with him. Yeah. You know, she and didn't so, cause a scene. She didn't, right. you know, yeah, like, like try oh, to scream and fight. Like, yeah. Right. And I think she wanted that opportunity to say her piece of like, this is done. Leave me alone. Mm -hmm. Peace, mm -hmm. bruh. And so I think that was awesome. But just a way, the way that Harry Belafonte played that. And Harry Belafonte is so fine and so composed <laughs> and so cool and classy any other time. But when they're in that closet, and he's sweating and his eyes are bugged out and he's the way mm -hmm. he's looking at her and he and you tramp and being short and aggressive mm -hmm. like it I, the way he played that role chat i just love dr him. rosie what are we gonna do about miss courtney here and, and her you know uh, is there a diagnosis for this um <laughs> obsessive probably <laughs> <laughs> it's, I'm delusional. I think that my crushes is just as the finest men that exist. Because in your, my mind, crush, I'm still gonna marry Michael like, B. Jordan. You're she, she oh, please, yeah. She does. Yeah. So I was gonna say, yeah. you know, that the the his Alexa commercial, forget it. It's like awesome. Okay. I've never felt so seen in my life. I was like, oh, I identify with this lead <laughs> character. <laughs> <laughs> that's my happy I still I have that queued up on my phone that's my happy place when it, when things start <laughs> when people start acting crazy around me I'm like let me just go into my Michael B. Jordan moment <laughs> so, oh, so I not you it. too <laughs> yeah. I, oh, no. I was gonna say we'll have to have another conversation another time but it's just but anywho Carmen Jones <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so um, so uh, you know, maybe your your crush might hear your podcast, and, and you know, possibly I'm gonna keep that I'm gonna keep that dream alive. I let it be known. Just keep everywhere. making a hashtag for him at the end every time. 
Hashtag. <laughs> I'm drinking my water. I'm doing my yoga. I'm getting, I'm healing intergenerational trauma so that whenever that man is ready for a wife, I will be ready. But anywho, for um, Cindy Lou Who, I am going to do reality therapy with her and I am going to ask her exactly what needs are, aren't being met. Like, what mm. are your needs and how aren't they being met in these relationships that you're seeking out with Joe or future mm-hmm. ones for if we do get that far and then try to really focus on like what okay so what is it that you want what are what are the things that you're doing to get you there let's evaluate that let's plan for the future let's just really work on all of those things so that you can get to a place where you can be healthy and move forward um yeah that's all I can think to do with Cindy because oh child <laughs> yeah and then I have to throw one thing in what's her relationship with other women Right. Because you don't see you see her dynamic with Joe, but we don't see that she has healthy relationships with other women. She does. We don't see her have healthy relationships with other human beings. (laughs) Right. That is very true, because we don't even know what the relation, the dynamic is, is at home, which is probably why she's on the go. And and just like, okay, Joe, we said we was going to build this life and this home. I don't got a home to go back to. Cause they keep telling her, go home to your ma, go home to your ma. Like Joe said that, Karma said mm-hmm. that, go baby. Well, I got my suitcase. Do you see my suitcase? <laughs> Man, I ain't got no home. This is everything I got right here. Hey, oh, poison is Oh, poor soul. Okay, so did you, did, uh, Dr. Rosie, did you diagnose Husky Miller at all? I did not. I didn't either. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't even really get much from him, but you know who did and who's fought this whole movie is and who, how this movie would have been again, a, 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 a short at the beginning of another film that had he not been a character is this old player hating ass Sergeant Brock. Pierce. I knew you and how he was, he, the PhD, I diagnosed him with one of our imaginary made up ones that we got from belly is okay. that we're going to put in our new uh, DSM because this oppressive tool that is the dsm just pathologic pathologizes regular behavior and coping mechanisms to trauma and experiences that people have but sergeant brock peters was a player hating dickhead and i'll tell you why not only was he a hater and he hated everything that joe did and joe's greatness and was just shining and excelling in every different way it it, it, he also was a creep he was going after every single girl that Mm. he was trying to get at which was Mm. very inappropriate especially how he was going at cindy lou because she didn't express any interest carmen at least was like okay let's go ahead okay so i can see that but cindy lou was like i don't know you get on my face sir Right. All of this was all his fault. You like you d- don't <sighs> hate him. He was like, you don't want him, Carmen. He can't even keep his shirt and his pants. Ha 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 ha. He's the reason uh, that Car- yeah. Joe had to leave Cindy Lou in the first place to go take Carmen to jail. He purposefully did that. She didn't first yep. of all have to go to jail because, like Dr. Benita said earlier, this was the interaction that they probably had regular. It's Tuesday. They fighting on the sewing machines again. So just roll them over and let them finish the parachutes on right. the opposite sides of the room like you usually do. But no, mm-hmm. just Sergeant Brock Peters saw that he, uh, Joe was up in there with Cindy Lou and was like, how can I break this up? Let me go send this man to a whole nother town yeah. because we can't uh, put re- civilians in, in pol- military jail. So then not only did he did do that, then when Joe finally came back, which means that he wasn't even trying to get at Carmen all hard, like for real, while Joe was locked up. Joe right. finally get back. Then he going to go try and go on the on the, the, the porch with them and be all interrupted. And they, if they love, he see that they having a little lover's quarrel disagreement. Right. Then you want to go insert yourself. You bum. That's why you got knocked out and thrown in the bushes. <laughs> Him into, you know, knowing that that Carmen would take advantage of the opportunity and then forcing him to go because he saw that Cindy Lou, that they were going to, you know, try to probably, I don't know if he knew about the, the idea of the quickie wedding, but he probably figured something was in alignment because Cindy Lou had her bags back. And right. so that's a, good point. <laughs> that's a good point that then he put, he put, Joe with Carmen, knowing that thing was going to explode. He was just putting light in a match to yeah, that. Yeah, basically. He knew, yeah. and he knew. And he, it was a two win for him, right? Because he would mess up Cindy Lou, and he would mess up Joe, and then he could have Carmen, which is unattainable for him, right? Carmen was mm-hmm. unattainable for him. Yeah. Or Cindy Lou. I feel like he would have took whichever one that he could get, because he knew that ooh, taking either one ooh, would have a negative ooh, effect ooh. on Joe. Ooh, yeah, ooh, that's that's Viper. That's Viper. Yeah, territory. I agree. I definitely agree. Yeah, and then he had some other kind of dynamic because, of course, he also had the dynamic with the military police, right? So he knew 
Mm-hmm. You know, he and then, you know he knew how to play all the all the players on the chessboard. So that's hitting a lot. superior, that's four years imprisonment. I hated his voice. And I'm really mad who I'm really mad at at this instance is the, the white casting director because they made him dark skin it's on darker. purpose I'm to further okay. separate and cause tension within the black community mm-hmm. by having a light skin, dark skin war going on between these two gentlemen. It's mm-hmm. all a, it's a it's a ploy by the man. You gotta watch him. He's tricky. Well, <laughs> that the light skin guy is the yeah. one who gets to be going to flight school and you know just on and on and on just the layers but just the, and the same thing with you know uh frankie and um mm-hmm. carmen, carmen you know like carmen's like oh you want my friend that's the only way you're gonna pay attention to me oh well yeah we good friends oh okay that's I can my come best now. friend that's child. my best friend okay mm-hmm. yeah so it was just like there's a there's a the dynamic of colorism of course in here as well um even with even with husky husky being the uh the boxer and then his manager being of a darker complexion you Very know dark. yeah and the, and the opponent and the also. manager's manager and the being opponent darker. right and yeah. the opponent, and the that, opponent he, that he won that he won over, even mm-hmm. though that opponent was really landing some very severe punches. Sure it was. And it yet, wasn't looking good at first. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that first round was a little rough. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. so there's a little, a, 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 not a little, a big colorism commentary going on throughout the movie as well. And then also too, you know, the whole, uh, how, how especially movies during that period dismissed black women and the value of black women and yeah. black women's beauty um and a lot of a lot of pressed hair a lot of and this movie further uh, uh kind of objectifies us where to where it's okay for violence towards black women they exactly. uh, they position carmen to where now we are mad at her now she's being mean to joe now we're like oh carmen's getting what she deserves no it's never okay for a man to kill a woman it's never yeah. okay for anyone to kill anyone else period so why are we like Sorry mm-hmm. for Joe. No, we don't yeah. feel sorry for Joe. Violence against women is always wrong. And, and then, you know, Dandridge and Otto Preminger, who was director and producer, you know, they mm-hmm. had a relationship and, and there's belief that he manipulated her. And, you know, there's oh. you know, lots of Ain't no about. belief. There is proven fact. That woman well, got okay. pregnant by him while he was married and he had the, the studio pressure her into getting an abortion. Ooh. That bum. Well, and he was that trying old, to do- ugly bum. <laughs> he was trying to, to build a career off of her, right? And so, mm-hmm. and then forcing mm-hmm. her to take uh, roles that weren't exactly, you know, like, 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 in other words, this was not a vehicle for her to become an Audrey Hepburn or for her to be, to have the flexibility to play more complex roles like Betty Davis. This was a vehicle for his own, I think, misogynistic nonsense, right? Absolutely. Yes, but one thing that I think we don't celebrate enough is Dorothy Dandridge uh, in this role of Carmen Jones being the first Black woman nominated for the Best Leading Actress by the Academy Awards for her role as Carmen Jones. And so uh, one big shout out and applause to her and yeah. the awesomeness that she brought to this film and all all of the, the characters, actually. They just yeah. did an amazing job and really bring to life and bring in Black experience as well to... Exactly. Um, white people trying to trying to write out black experience. Right. Shout out and to the background it, dancers who yes. brought Ooh, life to the movement. To, yes. I'm and sure would just send people dancing. Casting, that made sure that there were very dark skinned people who were at least mm-hmm. in the background and in the different roles. Um, I was very disappointed by the children in the beginning because- I know, they were you know, so, oh. Yeah, it just broke down in that commentary and the grandmother <laughs> being, cause they could have had a rich couple of scenes with her and her grandmother so we could see more mm-hmm. dynamic. So. So, you know, just just being able to see those things and recognize that those are, you know, that's the Hollywood machine and how it is very racist and very ruthless. And and Mm -hmm. yet these performers, these brilliant actors push through it anyway. And and I can't even imagine the the, you know, the publicity at the time and the things that were being said. And and I do know I remember hearing that um, that that, like you said, Dandridge got some heat about about the role of Carmen and how it was representing black women and stuff like that. And it's like, there are all different kinds of people, you know, race, first of all, is just a construct. So we know it's not real. It's just white society's, you know, label. So people come in all different shapes and sizes and ways and beings. And, 
and whatever the situations around us that all controls how we show up, right? And how we mm-hmm. experience life. And and we know more now, so we can do better and do more. But then, you know, like you said, Courtney, there were just the options were still limited. And for anybody who thinks that the options were better, then they're not a black person who understands that the options were zippo, like zero. Like you had a few things and you had to walk a very narrow, straight region. Yeah. And you took what you could and you you represented the best you could with what you And you, you tried to make something out of Plus, every single person deep down inside does want to have something that matters in their life, you know, like mm-hmm. a life that matters in some way. So with all those restrictions, still trying to carve out something and trying to find happiness, right? Yeah. So it was a lot for them. Um, and then, yeah, some somebody got to get this love thing figured out for the, all these folks because... <laughs> Honey, we coming like, down. Define it. <laughs> Define it and try to demonstrate what, what real love Son. looks like. <laughs> they struggling around here. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then thank you, Grandma, for bringing in all the, you know, all the clairvoyance and permanent. Yeah, that didn't help the situation any either. Right? Not at all. Yes, the commentary, though, on spirituality, I thought was awesome. And I said, Dr. Rosie's going to love this. Uh-huh. Did, 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 it, did it awaken your inner witchness that you got it going It did, on? <laughs> it did. And I was actually going to put that as a V code for um, Carmen for her spirituality and religious mm-hmm. issues. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. it was an issue for her and, and she it really became a thing so much so. Again, she spoke what what she believed her demise would be into existence. So, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, and you know, when you said that earlier, it just gave me a little bit of chills because mm. because so much of what you believe about yourself and and you know you it's like walking down by a bush and your sweater gets caught on a thorn and her thorn was that those premonitions and it's hard to unhook from that right yeah it is the people you the people closest to you the people you trust the people who you put your faith in give you information that can really spiral like destroy your life right so she put she was on a death wish she and didn't yeah. know and then when she did the cards herself that i think that was right. it was confirmed it but was i don't know if i only had a couple weeks slip i probably would have went with husky mother too so i didn't even go in front i can't okay. even blame karma for that one there uh-huh i probably <laughs> would go to chicago right go to chicago, get a pretty dress have you know something out right? of it in chicago <laughs> i probably would have thought a little carefully looking at joe in his eyes and been like you know, actually, I'll I'll meet you at the hotel later. Oh, Don't yeah. worry, I got exactly. you, Doctor yeah. Rose. So much, I would have said, yeah. <laughs> Can we first get out of this broom closet because yeah, this is not, little, this can't end well. <laughs> yeah, this is a little stuffy. I feel confined. Let's go outside. <laughs> <laughs> to make a decision, I'm going to need some air. Can we go outside? I mean, like, pew! Pew! <laughs> Take off my hand, Joe. Let's go outside. Right. She jumping off that train and getting down the hill. So I said she should have used some of them moves to get out of that closet. Okay. She really wanted to die that night because she done got out of too many situations for her to continue to be in this broom closet and end okay. up dead. I'm just saying, Carmen, you could have did better. I mean, yeah. Joe didn't seem like the one you wanted to try. But uh, (laughs) thank you again so much, Dr. Vanita, for joining us on this very special episode. It was so awesome to have you. Please let the listeners know how they can find you and or all uh, a little bit more about all the awesome things that you are currently working on and have in the works. Thank you. Yes, they can go to omnig.com and that's O-M-N-I-G-I.com and they can see some of the work that we're doing. Um, and, um, we'll be starting a podcast soon inspired because of the the two of you and the work (laughs) that you're doing. So we, we've, we've had it on the books for a long time, but we finally saw the inspiration to really, to do it. And so we'll be talking, so we'll be able to share that too, but it, but it'll be on the um, omnig.com website. So, but I thank you both so much for, this was so much fun. Uh, yes. I learned a lot and it, it was just awesome. You you both are amazing. And I wish you the most magnificent success because everyone needs to listen to your podcast. I'm Thank serious. We received that. Yes. <laughs> I'm, saying, I'm being sincere. I know a lot of times people say that and they're just trying to self-promote or whatever, but the work that you're doing can help everyone and, and you know, give people agency for this mental health and well-being, right? Because that's what yeah. we need. So 
thank you so much for what you're doing and adding to healing the the stigma around mental health. I really appreciate it. And thank you for having me as a guest today. <laughs> You'll make me cry. Oh, <laughs> I'm to- it's totally sincere. Yeah, this was amazing. Plus, you, you you guys help us do the mental health with some laughter, right? Because, yeah, yeah. I mean, we need to, I mean, it's serious, but we still need to have some levity. <laughs> right. That's but Black true. folks, you know, we make, we take everything on the chin and we're going to have a good time while we're doing it. <laughs> and so I hope that you all, all have enjoyed this episode. Please go watch the 1954 version of Carmen. You yes. can watch that. And if you can't get a hold of it, you can always just go and watch <laughs> Carmen, the hip hop with oh, Beyonce God. and Makai. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry, no. I couldn't go the whole episode and not bring that thing up. <laughs> But anywho, if you would like to support the show to help us get more content out to you all, you can visit our website and follow the support the show link to become a Patreon member or donate on our cash app. Now we're happy to get the kind of money that jingles, but we'd rather the kind that folds. You can visit our website to buy merch as well. As always, be sure to follow us on Instagram at the DSM podcast, and you can subscribe to our show wherever you get podcasts. While you're there, go ahead and leave us a comment because we are counselors and actually care about what you have to say. Until next time, y'all. Peace. Okay, bye.